All right, one to the two. You know how we do. What's up, everybody? BQ and Ro here. We're talking 2017 Bound for Glory. Talking about the show that happened last night as we're speaking to you right now. And uh, there's been a it's been a mixed bag so far as far as what everybody thinks of the show. And I'm just going to put this out there right now for you guys. Ro and I were not crazy about this show. We realize a lot of you probably did like it very much. So we're not going to like bash it in any way. Um, you know, we're going to speak on what we did like and what we didn't like. So, Ro, you know, I already know your, your general thoughts. But in a nutshell, before we start kind of breaking down the matches, in a, in a nutshell, what, do you, what were your, your takeaways from this? Um, you know, first that it wasn't the talent, you know, it, it seemed like they were really motivated to working in front of a live crowd and hopefully moving forward, they can do, you know, some live, live shows down the road because it seems like, you know, the talent's really engaged to be, you know, working live. But with that said, I felt like the talent delivered and the crowd was in into it, but the booking failed the talent horribly i mean outside of maybe you know one match i just feel like the booking did the talent a disservice and it's unfortunate yeah i thought the uh the talent worked really hard so i have nothing to say about the actual um well i mean i guess we have something to say about the matches but for the most part everyone did a really good job it was just it was really the the booking that kind of failed them i want to throw this out there right now i know that a lot of people um, I was I was part of the fight. Uh, <laughs> a few of the listeners were in there. It was funny, but I was part of the chat and in, in the fight uh, fight app. I was trying to stream it on my computer, but in my hotel room, my Wi-Fi is a little iffy, so I had to watch a majority of majority of it on my phone. And I was in the chat room with uh, Velvet Sky was <laughs> running the chat room, and a lot of people, including her, were saying, "Wow, this crowd is dead." And uh, as I've said with Impact, I, I since you know I was in the music industry for a while. Like I have an ear for mixing, for compression, for audio vocals, all that stuff. The commentary was way too loud. Um, I mean, it was, it was a volume that we could listen to it comfortably, but again, that audience volume was compressed very low. And I can tell you um, from people who I've spoken to who were there, a couple of our listeners were in the front row. I, <laughs> I had to, I had to write them on Twitter and Facebook cause uh, it cracked me up. But, um, they said it was pretty much deafening in there the entire time. It was very loud. Crowd was very engaged. Unfortunately, uh, aside from the X Division match, it just didn't come across. I want to say about Velvet Sky, too. I've complained about Velvet Sky a lot in the past. It wasn't mainly her. I just really took offense years ago when she... I, I, I think she kind of left the company, company temporary, and she was really pandering to the uh, WWE audience and... I, it, it rubbed me the wrong way as a fan. And uh, I guess I never really forgave her for it at the time. But I will tell you, spending time in there, her chatting with us and everything, I got nothing bad to say about Velvet Sky anymore. I even got her to unblock me on Twitter. So, uh, <laughs> I, so I got nothing bad to say about Velvet anymore. It was really cool that she was in there with us and talking. And I, at first she was just being like real generic, like who do you want to win this match and not really talking to people. But then like, then she started like really interacting and she was really honest too. Like she was like popping real big for Gail. I mean, you know, so she would let you know who she liked and whatever, but she would, she would be in there as a fan too saying, Oh, I don't think they should have done that. They should have done this, you know? So it was actually kind of cool seeing a wrestler in there really just being honest about what was going on. So it was it was actually kind of fun. There was one guy in there who was super negative and I mean, oh my god, everyone was like, "Dude, please leave." But, uh, <laughs> so see, you, I had it on full screen, so I I uh, didn't get to see the chat. Yeah, I, I tried doing it on full screen, and you know, like I said, my Wi-Fi here at the hotel was just is just crap. Um, it was doing pretty well, but then it got to the uh, tag team match, and I. I missed the majority of that tag team match, to be honest. It was buffering so bad. So I'm going to actually get a go, gonna go back and watch it. I don't want to say I missed the majority, but I, I missed a lot of it. It was skipping around so much. So I watched it on my phone. Stream was absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, so let, let's get into this. Again, we're going to do our best here to um, 
you know, to see both sides of everything, we realize there are some people who did like this very much. I, I liked last year's Bound for Glory a lot. I liked the year before a lot. I liked the last couple of anniversaries. In my opinion, this is the worst pay-per-view they put on in a little while. And I, I want to make it clear it's not the wrestlers. It was it was the creative. It was the booking. So let us get into it. Bound for Glory. First match of the evening was the X Division, as it typically is. And this was a six-way match. So one wrestler technically was supposed to be in there. And not one wrestler, but two wrestlers at a time. They were supposed to tag in and out. Seemed like it was kind of like Lucha Libre rules, too, a little bit. If someone rolled out of the ring, they were you know someone is able to step in and replace them. So first, before we even get into the matches, I hope I never see these video packages again. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, I watched the pre-show on YouTube. I watched it on Fight. I mean, all these, everything was on the last few episodes of Impact. And then before the matches, we got them again. Like, I don't want to see those ever again. <laughs> they need to be retired. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Delete that video from YouTube. No more. X Division title match. First one of the evening. Trevor Lee, Desmond Xavier, Matt Seidel, P.D. Williams, Sanjay Dutt, and Garza Jr., Everyone got an entrance. That's what I like about pay-per-views. You don't get the job or entrances ever. These people were so big time behind Petey Williams. This was the match they were super engaged in. And it must have been deafening in there because it was very loud just watching. Um, and through, through the night, you could hear the crowd die off. But I've been assured that it was extremely loud in there. I've said the same thing about the Impact Zone. It's way louder than it sounds on TV. So, X Division, what did you think about this one? Um, this was my favorite match. Um, I thought the way that they went about it, because when they first uh, advertised the match, you know, for some reason I thought they were just gonna have everyone in the ring, and I was like, oh god, you know, that could potentially be a mess. But I like how they implemented the lucha rules, and the ending I thought was pretty crafty on their part because now you know you could uh there's so many ways you can go you can have a uh, trevor lee feud with p williams because essentially he got screwed in his hometown uh you know with trevor lee taking the pin or um you know he could feud with uh, desmond xavier there's just so many different angles but um i like the match it was my favorite on the card by far so they they did the right thing in the sense that they set up a trevor lee and uh Desmond Xavier feud. So Desmond Xavier was one who got, no, wait, you know what? No, I'm sorry. Desmond Xavier got pinned in this one. I was thinking of the, uh, the match they had on impact. Desmond Xavier actually took the fall here after taking the Canadian destroyer. Did you see that Desmond Xavier landed on his feet? I, I didn't catch that. I, I was interested because I, um, you know, anytime PD does a destroyer, Cause just for me, it seems like there's certain people he does it to, he'll do it to like the same people because you know certain people know how to take it. So anytime I see someone who I've never seen take the move, I'm always curious because I remember in an interview he was talking about it's a safe move, but it's just sometimes people don't follow the rules, and you know obviously that's what leads to you know someone getting hurt. But now I didn't catch it. It looked like he hit it clean. Maybe I I, I but I didn't see. Yeah, to your point, uh, Caleb Conley has taken that thing I think 200 times in uh, three episodes of impact. So, um, yeah, he hit it really clean and Desmond Xavier actually landed on his feet and fell back. I mean, insane, you know, Desmond Xavier used to be in the air force like myself, same career field and everything. And I had uh, posted a picture with him that I took on Facebook the other day. And someone's like, Oh yeah, I knew him when he was in, I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I like, I, I like this a lot too. And uh, Trevor Lee took advantage of, you know, um, of the crowd quite a bit by being the only heel. And he really he, he really generated a lot of heat. I thought the finish was was absolutely perfect. I mean, I, I tweeted Trevor Lee probably doesn't even be walking, want to be walking the streets of Ottawa after that one. Because, <laughs> man, I think they wanted his head. It like really reminded me of like. 70s wrestling i mean before i was even a, i don't even know if wrestling was in the 70s i was i was born in the 70s but maybe i guess you could say early 80s but where the fans like wanted to kill the wrestlers i don't want to say it was that too com comparable to that but it, it just kind of reminded me of that pd williams used the uh 
Team Canada colors and the music and everything. So this was just a really great match. And thank God that, you know, Conley and Everett weren't involved and that we could just get a, a clean wrestling match. I thought Garza Jr. looked out of place a little bit. Yeah, I think because um, he's battling that sh something's wrong with his shoulder. And I think that uh, limited him. So, I mean, for him to even be out there and do what he was able to do, I mean, you know, th that takes a lot, you know, especially working through through an injury. But I think that limited him some. You know, that KT tape that he was wearing, I've seen many wrestlers wear it. And I'm like, what the hell does that do? But I have actually really bad shin splints and I've put them on when I run and they actually work wonders, oddly enough. But, um, so yeah, good stuff. The, the right person won, in my opinion, Trevor Lee, and he can move on with a, uh, he, he can feud with Petey Williams throughout these tapings. And I think that could be really, really good. So probably best match of the evening. Second match. So this was, uh, you know, obviously the red wedding between Rosemary and Taya was canceled. So we got Ishimori versus Tyson Dukes, uh, I, I, I kind of popped here in my room when Tyson Dukes came out. I was like, whoa, okay. They said his opponent was from Noah, and I, I was kind of hoping it was Marafuji, but Ishimori came out um, happy about that. I was excited for this. I was like, okay, bound for glory, uh, doing something different here, you know. It ended up kind of being a filler match. The company obviously didn't commit to the match. You know, they, they said there was X Division impl implications, that's probably just something they said, but I'm sure Ishimori is going to have some kind of X Division match here coming up in the tapings. But they obviously didn't commit to the match because Laurel Van Ness was in the crowd and she was the absolute focus of the entire thing. And when, when Tishi, uh, Ishimori hit that 450, I mean, to me, it was like out of nowhere because I was having a hard time following the match. Yeah, um... You know, I, my my thing with with it was because when I heard then um, a Noah participant, I was like, all right, let it be Ishimori because, you know, he's one of the guys I think, you know, I could see them putting the X-Vision title on, on the for, in the foreseeable future. But my thing was took away. I'm not familiar with Tyson. Uh, is it Dukes or Ducks? I, I can't pronounce it's, his name. It's Dukes. Duke Dukes. The, th the thing that I didn't understand, and I know it was just, you know, announcers putting it out there with the X Division implications, but also, you know, they, uh, Josh uh, clarified that, you know, Tyson Dukes is a free agent. So my question was, if he's a free agent and he's competing in a match where he can potentially get a future title shot it just doesn't make make much sense and I, I mean i get it you know a lot of times they just say say things it's just you know announcer talk but um yeah and they obviously didn't uh project this match to be anything of importance because you know the focal point was laurel van ness and i think that hurt it and it hurt ishimori's win and that was unfortunate right it's like they let us know right away that he was not signed by the company so it's like why are we watching this um, I, and I knew that he was in the Cruiserweight Classic, which Josh pointed out, but th that was something, you know, I know was a really hot, really hot item in the wrestling world. And, I, you know, I was like, man, that's cool. Now he's here, you know, but um, I, I would imagine he's probably going to be around for that set of tapings. But I mean, he does live in Canada there. So, it, you know, maybe he was just there for Bound for Glory. Oh, boy. Alberto El Patron promo what felt like it took about 45 minutes from top to bottom. He took the energy, all the energy that the crowd had had, he took it away. This, this was way too long, way too drawn out, way too slow. They could have condensed this. They could have cut this in half. And then there was no payoff at the end. He looked like he was going to, I, I thought he was going to like attack JB and then someone was going to come out and save him. And that wasn't even close to what happened. I mean, it was, he put us through that whole uncomfortable thing with JB only to be like, eh, tonight's going to be amazing. So he, he lets us know that he's going to main up to ruin the main event. He like pretty much uh, let us know from the beginning. And uh, I don't know, man, say something about this one. <laughs> oh, um, nah, I, uh, um, it just seemed forced. Like here's, El Patron. I knew the t the promo where the promo was headed, but the one thing I could tell you with live, you know, li them doing a live show, 
Um, and I don't know if you caught this, but when he was talking and the camera was on him, there was someone in the audience flipping him off. And, you know, that I mean, obviously, that's just one one fan. I mean, there were some other fans, too, that were booing him. But I hope the company realizes this guy isn't as over as they might believe. I mean, there might be I can't speak for everyone, but to make him be the focal point probably isn't the best idea. And yeah, he was rambling and, you know, he teases the confrontation with JB and there was no payoff. You know, I thought uh, as he started walking away and uh, JB put the headset on, I was expecting him to, you know, sidekick him or slap him, do something. But he just walked away and, you know, pretty much just saying, I'm going to be a part of the main event. I'm going to ruin it. So, you know, essentially, you know, leading up to the main event, it's not so much as if, but when is he going to appear? So I, I just thought it was dumb but yeah yeah this was uh i was i mean i I did want to hear what he had to say but it was it was almost like everything we just expected he was gonna say there was just no mystery to it whatsoever and that would that was a killer so early in the show uh monsters ball was after this every match had the video package beforehand and the video package was just they were they were too long you know usually i commend the company for kind of getting to moving on to the matches fairly quickly. But the, the video packages were, again, I don't want to see them ever again. So Monsters of Ball, Abyss versus Grado, universally, I, I have not spoken to a single person that liked this match. Universally, everyone felt that this was a complete mess, a complete train wreck. I thought Grado, I, I thought you texted me and said Grado didn't get enough offense in, but I actually thought Grado got a lot of offense in. I don't feel that Abyss was very dominant in this, and I don't think the Abyss character can move forward in a dominant manner because if you got, you know, happy go lucky dancing around the ring to Madonna, Grado getting that much offense in, I mean, how, how do you move on with that Abyss character forward? I mean, he's not. I don't know. Um, there were some good matches. I mean, good moments here. I thought Grado off the top a couple times was great. Grado, Grado took some bumps. He really sacrificed his body in this. So, again, I don't want to say the wrestlers didn't work hard for this, but it was just very sloppy. Laurel Van Ness came out, and I liked that. I like when she hit a, hit the finisher. I know that's her indie finisher. I think she needs to use that instead of the curb stomp. I liked when she hit that. I think what happened, I want to get your opinion on this. I think that was initially the, the finish of the match. But because they were trying to find something for Rosemary to do, she came down, attacks Laurel, missed her, only to help Abyss try to beat Grado. And then that she, miss, she misses with the miss, missed Abyss. Grado goes for the gimmick roll-up that looks like crap. Abyss actually kicks out. Choke slams Rosemary onto the tax, which was kind of like a holy ish moment. But dude, as we've talked on the podcast and we've talked offline, Rosemary has looked weak every time she's been on TV almost since she's turned babyface. In one way, shape, or form, she is she has looked weak. So your thoughts on Monsters Ball and this uh overbooked finish. Um I, I thought when the earlier promo that um, Grado and, and Abyss had where uh, Grado was talking about, you're going to see a different Grado. I feel like with his character, they've kind of been inconsistent because on one end, they make him super serious. So you kind of somewhat believe like, OK, you know, he this guy's serious. Then he gets in the ring and he's dancing. And what I mean as far as offense is. I can't recall him outside of maybe that splash off the rope getting any kind of offensive maneuver that didn't require him using the weapon. I mean, no neck breaker, no DDT. I mean, I'm assuming he couldn't lift Abyss, but, you know, anything. And um, it just it, it just was a big mess. I think having Laura Van Ness interfere and cause a greater of the match, they could have ended it right there. It would have made sense. There's continuity with, you know, him not marrying LVN. Then you have Rosemary come out to attack LVN. Why? We don't know. Okay. Then, you know, she teases the alliance with Abyss and and, and instead of and I, I thought I, I thought she was gonna cost Abyss the match. You know, she teases the alliance with Abyss, goes to attack Grado. 
hits abyss instead you then i'm thinking that oh okay well great is going to win you know off of the miscommunication no abyss kicks out then he attacks rosemary because he's blinded by the miss it was just it was just a mess like it was an overbooked mess i i thought they should have just kept it simple if you're going to have lvn Cost greater the match, fine. If you're gonna have Rosemary interfere, she should be helping Grado. It just nothing made sense. And in in the end, did Abyss really need the win? I mean, uh, I you know the one takeaway I took was maybe Grado's done with the company. I don't know. Um, if he's not, I'm sure they'll find a way to write him back in. But it just it was a mess, a big mess. I felt like Grado probably is done with the company, but at the same time, because the thing is they 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 fly Grado out every taping and I'd imagine that's fairly expensive for someone who's not in the main event scene, not even in the mid card scene. But with that being said, flying him out to Canada too, only for him to be done with the company. I can see where he's like, you know, they wanted to respect him with a proper send off cause he wasn't going to be with the company further, but getting him all the way to Canada is, is, is kind of a, kind of a stretch for someone who's just, who's going to want and done it. Not one right. and done, but I mean, wrestle that one night and then be done. So I I, I don't know. I, I feel like they're going to write him back in. I, I actually like Grado. My wife loves him, so I, I don't want to see him go. But, uh, you know, I don't think he should be on impact every single week by any means. But Yeah, and then with Rosemary, and this is the one thing I was thinking, and not just with Rosemary, but some of the other stars we've been talking about, I'm starting to wonder if maybe us fans have more faith in some of these talents than management does. And I think, you know, when you're talking about regime changes, it seems like every time a new regime comes, you know, yeah, we have guys, you know, wrestlers that we're high on, but maybe they're not high on them. And not to get off a subject, but I just want to use this as an example. You know, remember, you know, AJ, when AJ was with the company, he was the face of the company. And then when Hogan and Bischoff came, like, yeah, they would talk about, yeah, AJ, you know, he's a top name, but you could tell they weren't fully behind him. I mean, hell, they had a RVD uh, beat him for the title, um, RVD's first night. Then they had the whole... Um, where AJ was the mini Ric Flair. So, you know, and I, I was thinking, I'm like, they obviously don't believe in this guy. And I'm worried with Rosemary and others that maybe they don't believe in, you know, her and some of these other stars that we're high on, like us fans do. I thought Rosemary looked badass as far as her outfit, her hair. That hair is a is absolute keeper. She had the one white contact and she looked, she looks pretty badass. And, you know, I, I have social media. I don't have to watch the other company's product to know that they they put a, together a big match with Finn Balor and, and AJ because of a cancellation. They had an opportunity here to put Rosemary. If you weren't going to put her in a match with Laurel or something like that because you felt, you know, creatively, how are you going to pull that off? You They actually had an opportunity here. There's a lot of talent in Canada they, I feel like they could, I, I can't, I'm not going to say, you know, some kind of dream match on the level of what I just said, but they could have done something pretty special. But instead we got that Ishimori and Tyson Dukes match. They could have done something special with Rosemary and they just threw her into this in order to give her something to do. And that was, that was really unfortunate. Uh, I think the, I think the finish of the match absolutely was supposed to be Laurel hitting her move on Grado and Grado uh, losing at that point. I'm, I'm almost positive. But yeah, but don't, don't you think though, if they, and maybe it's just me, maybe I'm overthinking it, but don't you think if they seen Rosemary as a big star, like a lot of us fans do, don't you think they would have used her to, in a better capacity? Cause even her uh, interfering in the match, I mean, she took, the the worst bump of everybody in the match and she wasn't even a part of the match like they just kind of <laughs> made her look like a joke and it's just it, it just leads me to believe like they're not big on her or somebody in creative isn't as big on her as us fans are and that's really unfortunate because to me i i think she's one of the draws of the company like she's somebody that needs to be on damn near every show i agree i i'm not uh i'm not too worried about that in that sense i think they're just doing a crappy job of booking her, but I don't think it's, I think they feel like they're building sympathy for her. That's not how I'm, I'm taking it personally, but 
All right, your favorite match of the evening. I say that jokingly because this was the one you were you were probably least excited about. Uh, Team Impact, Ethan Carter the third, Eddie Edwards and James Storm versus Team Triple A, El Hijo del Fantasma, Pagano and Tejano. All right, um, you know I, I didn't mind this match. I actually thought uh, I think James Storm when he did that flip off the top rope that was that was one of the really cool moments of the match. It's just that the build up to this match was was so bad that it was it was you weren't emotionally invested in this. You were kind of watching it as hey, this is kind of cool Impact versus AAA, but there was not a lot of emotional investment in it, d- despite um, three of the top Impact stars being in this match. I was actually pretty impressed with uh, Pagano in this match. I, I really liked a lot of his offense. He had he didn't see much time on Impact at all. He wrestled one match. And I think he might have been in someone's corner at one point, but he, he really had nothing to do with Impact the last uh, the, the the set of tapings, which was kind of odd. So with all this being said, I know this is one you weren't looking forward to. How did you feel about it once you actually finally got to watch it? Um, I mean, it was one I kind of was disinterested. Um, you know, there were some cool spots, but you know, Pagano to me, um, um, and some some of his offense. You know, he looked kind of, it looked kind of lackadaisical, like, you know, some of his slaps. I mean, I don't know if that's just his style, but, um, you know, the big takeaway, and I know they were promoting it, and it got me looking forward to um, the Phantasma versus uh, Eddie Edwards match. I thought Phantasma did well, and even Texano uh, did okay. But, um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it was something we, – we've seen the match so much the past couple episodes of Impact. So to see it at the pay-per-view, it really, you know, didn't really do anything for me. Yeah, and they, they had the interview segment beforehand where EC3 was, you know, being a heel. And in the match, he didn't want to tag in right away. And, you know, I, I thought that was just all, all kind of weird. But I thought the match was okay. Again, James Storm doing that flip off the top, and I think he jumped off the top rope another time too. I thought that was all all pretty cool. You know, I'm not going to BS you. You might have to let me know here. I missed the finish of the match. I uh, I stepped away from my uh, phone for one second to go do something, and right then and there, the match was over. So it sounded like James Storm kicked somebody. Yeah, I th- I think he uh, gave the last call to Texano. Okay. All right, so that was a little feud in there, Tejano and uh, James Storm. And Team Impact got the win. I don't think that was a big surprise to anybody. And then, you know, Eddie Edwards took that pile driver on the ring apron that looked absolutely devastating. That was a pretty crazy spot. So EC3 and James Storm, you know, the match is over. And they're both in there celebrating. And Eddie Edwards is on the outside, like, almost out cold. I know it was nice to see him get up. There's, I think that was the one thing that took, you know, took me out of the match because it's like, oh dang, you know, I hope, you know, he's okay. And uh, you know, seeing him get up, and I, I think he entered the ring after they were celebrating. Um, you know, it was nice to see because it's like, dang, we can't afford to lose him. You know, he's a good hand to have. Yeah, I think uh, James was pouring a uh, beer down his throat from the top rope or something like that. So, um, but EC3 celebrated with him afterwards, and you know there wasn't any tension. So, not sure where all that is going, but I, I, I guess it was it was cool for what it was. I think they expected it to be a lot bigger of a match and a lot bigger of a deal than it ultimately was. It is what it was. So. Um, what do we, what do we got after this? The tag team championship match, 5150 street fight, OVE versus LAX. So what I want to say about this again, my, my computer screen was cutting in and out, but I, you know, I saw a majority of the big spots. I did think this match was actually really good. I think they took a lot of chances. I think both teams looked really, really good. Not real high on OVE. I think they took Reno Scum's spot, and I'll never forgive him for that. But I thought the match was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Uh, what I what I didn't understand, LAX acted like the, the, you know you're not facing just us, you're facing all of us. You know there was no homicide who was obviously taken out. There was no Diamante who that concerns me a little bit. I'm actually gonna hit up some people in Canada and ask if she's at the tapings. Um, because she wasn't even tweeting or anything like that. Uh, she did retweet one thing from the match today. 
but I'm a little concerned about that one right there. But LAX had no extra help. And uh, what was really weird with this, so Sammy Callahan debuts, kind of got over like a fart in church, if I'm being honest. I don't know that the people could see who he was, but, you know, the company does such a bad job, well, they have in the last year or so of, of surprises. You know, they always let you know ahead of time who to expect. You knew El Patron was coming. You knew Sammy Callahan was coming. It, it, would, it would be a lot cooler if we can just, they can just hit us with a surprise. But Sammy Callahan came down to help. This is the weird thing, Ro, is that OVE didn't need the help at the time. So Sammy Callahan comes down. I think they said he threw salt or something like that, like Mr. Fuji style and, and Conan. And then they helped put LAX away. I don't really understand why he had to help them. And the numbers game ended up being an advantage of OVE because LAX didn't have anybody help him. This is what I think. I don't know. I haven't talked to you about this. I think there was this was supposed to be a double turn. And I think it was just done really bad. What do you think? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Um, they probably just did it on the fly because, you know, the whole point of Sammy Callahan uh, helping OVE was to for the numbers game. And, you know, what confused me, because this was one of the matches I had thought, you know, they'll probably work outside the arena and, like, say they show some, um, you know, shows in, you know, maybe show some footage of them in Crash where, you know, we've seen OVE in Crash where the numbers game, you know, was it was a disadvantage for them. And, you know, having LAX, you know, come out and, you know, not having any help and then Calhan coming in and, you know, helping, aiding OVE the win, you know, that's what I thought it was a double turn. And I think any that what solidified it was what he was doing to the flag. Um, I, 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 I was Is that the Cuban flag or Puerto Rican flag? That's I'm a, sorry. That's a Puerto Rican flag. <laughs> Puerto, Puerto Rican flag, but you know, doing all doing all of that. I mean, even if you're not Puerto Rican, I mean, spitting on you know someone's flag, that's just the ultimate disrespect, and that's not something that you see from a babyface team. And then um, they showed after um, you know back backstage, well, it was you know, after the pay per view, um, and he was cutting some promo, and you know, very hillish promo. So I think they probably looked at the crowd reaction because. I think everyone was pro LAX and just decided on the fly, hey, let's turn these guys. That's really what I think happened. I think it, they just did a bad job of it. Um, you know, they were kicking him right after the bell, you know, hitting him afterwards, you know, covered him in the flag, you know, my flag. So they're disrespecting that now. And, um, you know, they went straight to the video package for the next match. They didn't really allow, they didn't allow us to bask in anything. As soon as the match was over, it was always cut to video package. And they've always been like that. Impact is like that when we're watching from week to week. It, we don't we don't bask in the in the finishes at all. So it would have helped if we, you know, saw them going back to the, you know, back, backstage, you know, just walking away from the ring. We could watch their demeanor. But I think this was supposed to be a double turn, and um, which is probably a pretty decent idea because LAX is way more over than these guys. I mean, it, it's not even a competition. The finish was extremely flat. The last time these two got in the ring, these two teams, and they won the titles, the finish was flat. If OVE is supposed to be the babyface winning, it's flat. If they were the heels winning, then that makes sense. You know, because heels winning are oftentimes kind of flat, but it works when you're the heel. So, yeah. OVE is still your champions. Yeah, but you know what confuses me now is... You know, with LAX, I mean, I guess you can leave them neutral, but I mean, I hope it's not something where they just go full on baby face. I, I think that'll kill the edge that they have, you know, a little bit. But um, yeah, it just it just came off real, real weird. And, you know, something they just decided, you know, on the fly, you know, going by the crowd reaction. Hey, but in, in, a, in a way, in you know maybe you disagree but i kind of felt in in some ways that uh, lax came off kind of weak a little bit what what do you think yeah maybe a little bit but again that that goes back to where i think they were trying to actually make them baby faces here okay so uh, i don't know I, i'm really excited to see i'm interested to see lax here on the tapings and and how they handle them again i'm very concerned that diamante was in ringside Maybe it didn't make sense, consider considering the way the match was booked. 
you know, maybe it just didn't make sense to have her out there. But yeah, and last thing, you know, here's the thing though with them turning, it still doesn't solve the problem that we have the lack of tag teams. I mean, you could only have these guys feud for so long. Um, hopefully, at these tapings, you know, we see some new tag teams debuting, or hell, you know, some of the people that they're not using. It's okay to do a couple of makeshift tag teams. You know, you, it, sometimes those tag teams end up be, becoming, you know, good tag teams. But um, that, I think that's one concern. And, maybe you know, maybe that's f- further down the road. Yeah, I agree. Just just throw, throw some teams together. I mean, I don't know. Just do it. Do it. Knockouts championship match. Sienna versus Ali versus Gail Kim. This was initially supposed to feature... Taryn Terrell yeah man no Taryn absolutely heartbreaking but but we got a good match this was my favorite match of the evening I thought the women looked work, worked really hard and I guess I was really impressed that they were able to pull off two baby faces and a heel in a triple threat usually it's two heels and a baby face I guess I was impressed with how they were able to to pull it off and um I, you know they, they kind of went with the win that I think a lot of people expected, and that was Gail Kim winning. And they did say here, and they didn't say this previously, she had said, I don't know when my last match is. She's, they they had said here that this was her last match. Like, this was it going out on top. I, you know, I'm curious to see what they're going to do with the tapings with the Knockouts Championship. I think it's a great way to debut some new Knockouts if they do a gauntlet or a tournament. Most likely, they will do a gauntlet. Let's Let's be real with ourselves. Uh, so what you think about Sienna, Ali, and Gail Kim? Um, you know, it, it was good. Uh, I kind of felt, you know, not adding Rosemary or LVN, you know, kind of made it, like, not, not adding them. I felt like it kind of made it a little more predictable. Um, you know, Gail get, gets the win. I kind of wish th- um, the announce team didn't announce as far as, oh, you know, let's see what's going to happen this week because – I think they had mentioned the retirement. I would have rather them kind of just focus on, you know, celebrating her winning her seventh knockout title. And then, you know, you can announce during the week as far as, oh, Gail Kim, you know, she has some you know, she wants to say. But it just kind of felt like they were pretty much telling us fans like, all right, she's in, she won the title. Now she's going to retire. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe that, that was just kind of like how I took it. Yeah, that is that is kind of how they delivered it. I think Al, I thought Allie looked outstanding in this as far as we're, we're starting to get, you know, she's still the Allie character, but she's out there busting her ass in the ring now. And she's finally getting to compete the way that she wants to. I really like when Sienna was doing the double choke on them. I thought that was, was done very well. There were some moves. There were some spots in this. I mean, Gail doing the, uh, the hurricanrana and, you know, there was definitely some spots in this. I wouldn't be surprised if some people didn't care for this match, but I actually thought it was really good. And I actually really liked the finish when she kind of dumped Allie over the top rope and took her out of the match. And then as Sienna, um, you know, turns around, whatever, takes the, the E defeat off the ropes. I mean, I didn't see that coming at all. I know she's, that's how she used to, you know, beat Kong and everything. But, uh, you know, she really hit that out of nowhere. And I thought it was well done. I thought the end of the match was was well done. I thought I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was good for Gail Kim's last match, personally. Uh, so we're gonna see what happens with Gail Kim at the tapings. All right. So so Jimmy Jacobs comes out. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not like insanely familiar with it with his work. I know that he you know wrestled with Ring of Honor, and I know he's, he did creative with WWE. I believe his role. I was reading today. He is gonna be a backstage producer. I don't believe he's gonna be an in-ring talent. And they said he was responsible for some of the. As questionable as WWE's creative is at times, they said he was responsible for a couple of the more entertaining angles in, in, the, in the past. Uh, they they did like the best friend angle with Jericho and K. Owens, or Kevin Owens or something like that. And and they said that was his kind of his baby. So he's a creative mind that, that hopefully will uh, enhance the product of the weekly TV show. The people didn't know who he was. However, with that being said, the commentary booth was in the very back. So I don't know how you could really see him walking up. I don't know if the big screen covers it or whatever, but, you know, 
that's something I said I, I read to you. Well, people didn't know who he was. Like he's not that popular. It's it it wasn't like uh you know Austin Aries came down and people didn't know who he was. So you know I I didn't really really didn't think anything of it. I'm in agreement with you. I don't even know who I don't know who he is. I mean I've heard the name you know bounce around, but. I was unfamiliar with who he was, but um, seeing that he's going to be a part of the creative team, because that was one thing I was thinking. I was like, ho- you know, hopefully with these new tapings, with the new creative team intact, we can really see, you know, what you know their imprint on some of these shows. So next we get the Six Sides of Steel match. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this one. We haven't really talked about, you know, usually we, we, we discuss things offline and we didn't this time around. So Six Sides of Steel, Lashley and King Mo versus Moose and Stefan Bonner. I had said in our preview show that this could either be really good or really bad. I think it was kind of both. I could see where some people really liked this and I could see where some people absolutely hated it. I could see both sides. I think what was bothering me at first was every time they were teasing Mo and and Stephen Bonner going at it, uh, Moose and Lashley took him out. And we spent what seemed like the first five minutes of the match of Moose beating on King Mo and, and Lashley beating on Stephen Bonner. You got to give props to Stephen Bonner for taking a power slam. And, you know, he, he went out there and he took some bumps. I think they were trying to build up some heat between Stephen Bonner and King Mo, but they didn't really give us a, a, a reason to care about the two of them and whatever issue they had during the tapings because King Mo was never there. And um, I think they were trying to, to 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 tease it and build some heat of, oh, we, these two want to get their hands on each other. But, you know, uh, Lashley and Moose kept, kept getting in the way. I thought, I didn't think they did a good job of all four mixing it up at the same time. It, it always seemed like it had to be uh, two of them going at it. Like it was only, they could only do one-on-one. So, I personally really appreciated that they did the MMA stuff instead of trying to do some terrible wrestling moves. I actually thought that was, (laughs) I thought that was actually pretty creative. I saw a lot of people in the chat room were like, what the hell are they doing? And it's kind of like, well, do you want to see them go out and and, and half-ass some wrestling moves? You do want to see them do what they do. So I actually really appreciated that. I I thought it was kind of cool. I thought it was a very creative idea. I don't know that it got over the way they wanted it to, but I actually thought it was kind of cool. So what do you got on the six sides of steel? Um, it was okay for what it was, but uh, once again, you know, I hate to say it, it ended up becoming an overbooked mess. Um, I thought once Moose was out of the cage, well, first off, you know, I didn't anticipate to see any of, you know, the America's top team in the cage. You know, I thought, you know, we were finally going to get a payoff for this feud. But uh, once Moose got, you know, thrown thrown out, you know, I thought, okay, well, here's the end. You know, uh, Bonner's going to take take the pin. And um, then we get the big spot from Moose. The thing that I was looking for was, you know, for Moose to finally get his comeuppance. Um, if Lashley's on his way out, I thought Moose should have won this match. Or, you know, if Moose is going to lose and have Bonner eat the pin. But with Moose, you know, being around for the foreseeable future, I thought he needed this win. Lashley didn't need it. Or, you know, you could have had Mo eat the pin if you didn't want Lashley to eat the pin. I just felt like, you know, who benefited from this match? I mean, we see, we've seen America's top team dominate impact programming outside of, um, I want to say the most re- recent episode where, you know, Moose and Bonner finally get their comeuppance a little bit. But, um, you know, who benefited from the match? I thought, you know, this was an opportunity to really propel Moose, you know, to the next level. Because once again, his matchups with Lashley, he's always been on the losing end. So, it, 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 you know, it was fine for what it was, but then it just became an overbooked mess. And America's top team stands tall. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I didn't expect that finish at all. And again, I don't, I don't know what they gained by winning. I don't want to jump to conclusions because we got a whole set of tapings coming and and I'm sure they've got something planned. But I I found that really odd because Moose and Lashley have wrestled several times and Moose never beats him. And I thought this was the opportunity for him him to win. So, you know, it's like you said, what what does Moose gain by this? Maybe this was a, if anything, a, a realistic finish. 
you know, Americans top team. I thought that was really overbooked when they got in the cage, but you know, it was realistic. I mean, it was a uh, 50 on two and the 51, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, that's true. You see that too much in wrestling where it's like somehow that, you know, those two pull it out and defy the odds. I mean, at least this was realistic. I think Josh Matthews made it clear that Col- Colby Covington is the only person, the only name he knows on that entire team. <laughs> yeah, because he was uh, promoting um, something, I guess, with the UFC. I I, I didn't catch it. But, uh, yeah, that was my thing. I'm like, you know, here's the big show. You know, when's the baby face going to get the payoff? And, I mean, there's really no reason for the feud to, to continue. AT&T pr- pretty much proved what they wanted to prove. And, um, yeah, just an overbooked mess for me. So now that they won, pro wrestling is done, apparently. So we're, we're going out of business, thanks to America's top team. All right, so main event of the evening, global championship match, Eli Drake versus Johnny Impact. We called it on this podcast. Everyone knows that we called it, that Alberto El Patron would ruin this match because the company would not go off the air with Eli Drake or Johnny Impact. Something that Velvet Sky was saying in the in the you know again she was being like real honest she's like why did they even say he was coming back why didn't they at least save it for a surprise because she's like we knew the entire show from the very beginning that he was going to come out and ruin the main event and it, it was like we were just waiting for it to happen and it dude this was so WCW like it there's times where it's okay for wrestling to be predictable this was so freaking predictable. We all knew that the match was going to happen, something like this. Aside from that, I thought these two put on a really good match. I thought Eli Drake looked awesome. You know, we didn't have to, I don't remember having to, you know, uh, worry about uh, Chris Adonis too much in it. I don't think he was too involved. I, Dude, I, I just thought the whole match was actually really good. I thought they were delivering as far as a main event. What did you think? Yeah, um, for me, because... During this time on the show, I was kind of like, man, this just doesn't feel like, you know, big pay-per-view. But this match was really saving the show for me. And I know we talked about it, but I'm like, I don't understand why Impact doesn't have faith in these guys. These guys are delivering. It was a a nice main event. You could tell Eli Drake was motivated. Um, Johnny Nitro motivated. They were putting on a good match. And I knew eventually interference was going to be... Um, be end up being some kind of a factor, but the interference we got, man. And if I may, here's my thing, and it, it just didn't make any sense. You have El Patron interfere and pull the referee out. Okay, you could have. They could have done a scenario where you have Nitro. You know, wait, what are you doing? And you know, that'd be the reason why uh, uh, Eli Drake retains. That's fine with that. But no, they have him attack Nitro, okay? So then I'm thinking, okay, well... Johnny Nitro? Yeah, Johnny Nitro. I mean, not Nitro. I'm sorry, Impact. <laughs> well, he's He's gone so... He's, he's changed his name so much. I mean, I, I thought out of all the names, they could have came up with something better than Impact. I'm, my apologies. But they have him uh, attack Impact. And I thought, okay, and then this is, this is how Eli's going to win. Nah, they had then they have him attack Eli. So I'm like, oh, so they're gonna let Impact win. Then he goes and attacks Impact and then drapes Drake over Impact. And that's how Impact wins. So he comes in, ruins the main event. He's he ends up being the focal point. Make Eli look like a joke. Make uh Impact look like a joke. It just it was just a big old mess. They just I even tweeted after. I'm like, really? That's how you're gonna end it? Like these guys, if you give them an opportunity, these guys can deliver. They were putting on a fine main event. I was like, damn, they're really they're really showing some faith in Eli. But like I was saying earlier, I'm I'm starting to believe they don't have faith in some of these guys like we do. Yeah. And they need and they need to put that faith in Eli Drake. And yeah, I, I went back to the you know, I thought of the episode of Impact where Eli Drake was on the phone and it, it, they kind of teased that it was with Alberto, but I don't think so because he wouldn't have come out and ruined the main event like that. Not, not in that way. So that was all really weird. 
I think that he helped Eli Drake win because he wants Eli Drake to beat him. Eli Drake is the one that took his title technically, never beat him for it. So I think, um, ugh, sounds like a heel versus heel feud or I hope they don't go Probably baby. Triple threat. Yeah. I hope they don't go baby face with Eli Drake because that would be a mistake. Um, cause once you turn Eli Drake baby face, he's going to stay that way forever. Most likely. So I, I, I don't really want him to go that route. I think a triple threat is coming because, you know, he did completely ruin the match, but, and sure enough, they went off the air with, uh, Alberto El Patron. So yeah, it, it was a mess, man. It, it really just left a bad taste in my mouth. And once again, like I said, it's nothing on the talent. I just felt like the booking really failed the talent And this match right here. This was the one I was looking forward to the most. And, you know, to have him, we already knew he was going to interfere, but to have him interfere like that and then the one chair shot to uh, impact, man, like that, it kind of got me mad some because I'm all like, dang, you know, no protection for your fellow, um, you know, wrestlers where the, you know, the chair broke on his head, you know, hopefully he's all right. But I just felt felt like he was forced into that spot. Um, I thought if you were going to have him interfere, you know, you could have done the simple distraction, and then that's how Eli um, gets to win. And then maybe have El Patron enter and attack Eli. But to have him attack both, like, you know, I'm the guy. Like, no, nobody should be bigger than the champion. And I just felt like it's not if but when they're going to put the belt back on him. And if they do put the belt back on him, it what, 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 how did they really punish him? I mean, I know... You, and I'm not trying to dive too much into it, but, you know, the whole point of taking the title off of him was to reprimand him. So after he serves his suspension, OK, here, we're going to not only put you back in the main event, but we're going to put the title back on you. What do you, what 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 have you proved? I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. It's just, and that's why I know you were telling me you're like, man, the dirt sheets, they're going to they're going to love it. I mean, this is one of the rare times where, you know, there is some credence. I mean, this was. You know, Bound for Glory was their big show, and um, it just, just it just seemed really could have passed. For, at least in my eyes, it could have passed for you know a regular imp- episode of Impact. It's unfortunate. It's crazy how they they were able to make the arena look exactly like the Impact Zone. I mean, it, yeah. it looked just like it, with obviously about ten times the people, you know, from an episode of Impact. So you got to think Bound for Glory and Slammiversary. In the impact zone, you usually hit capacity at at about 1,100, 1,200. There was probably double that, I would imagine. Um, obviously, on the camera side, you know, it looked fairly standard, but they had rows upon rows um, on, on on the side, um, not not the non camera side, but to the side of that. So there was definitely a lot of people there. I was happy to see that, and I'm excited for the tapings. I really am. I feel like they they are hopefully can save some of this, but you know the downfall of this was just a lot of overbooking. But I mean, there wasn't a wrestler on this roster who didn't who didn't take a chance and you know put their body on the line in one way, shape, or form. I mean that they all worked their butts off for the matches. The actual wrestling was good. It was just the finishes. It was just the creative and you know stuff like uh. Uh, double turn that didn't go over well, the uh, overbooking with Rosemary, which that just that was just nonsensical, and then the El Patron thing. So let's we'll see what happens on this um, on the on the on the tapings here, and hopefully we just get a get a really strong week. And unfortunately, this news came out where they're paying people to attend for the shows Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Apparently, Monday and Friday did fine with the ticket sales, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're looking for extras, as they call them. And this was really difficult to see online, made my stomach turn. I am looking into this. If there is a rumor killer, I will kill it. But man, that was a kick to the gut. What did you say? Yeah, and like I said, I thought, you know, even leading up to Bound for Glory, I thought with everything that had happened with Jared and some of the departures, you know, whether or not they were people that were being utilized, I really felt like them having to go back to Impact Wrestling. I really thought this rebranding 
hurt this this go around. I mean, I know they've done it in the past and they've been able to be okay, but I really just just and it it kind of showed in some ways with in with this pay per view. You know, I found myself thinking, you know, had Jared been been around, you know, what did he have in store as far as creative? I mean, the the biggest thing too was, you know, I thought the hometown people, you know, LVN, Rosemary, I thought, you know, they'd be looked in a greater light in, you know, you, you know, I mean, LVN, I mean, LVN got to look better than Rosemary. I mean, they made Rosemary really look like a joke. That really kind of didn't go over well with me personally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, one thing we forgot to talk about real quick before we, before we wrap this up, <laughs> what'd you think of Moose's entrance? Um, you know what? He's always doing something, you know, something unique. I, I thought it was fine. I mean, was his Slammiversary, if I'm not mistaken, where he had the cheerleaders? Was it? Was it? Was that when he had had wh- wh- which pay per view? Do where he had the cheerleaders? That was, I think, that was yeah, it was Slammiversary, because because Bound for Glory, he had um last year he had all the like the high schoolers with the uniforms come out. Yeah, I mean, it was fine, but then it's like you give this guy this grand entrance and, you know, he loses. I mean, <laughs> it's unfortunate. Yeah, I know. Uh, all right. Yeah. I I I personally thought the uh the um <laughs> the entrance was a little little awkward, but um yeah. I'm on Tessa Blanchard's Twitter. She she tw- she um cleared all her tweets. Mm, I wonder why. Interesting. We're gonna know here eventually if she's uh coming over or not. I'm sure. Oh wait, now that now they loaded. How weird. It was like completely um they were like completely gone now all of a sudden they loaded, so maybe it's just my phone. Ooh, alright. Well she was watching Bound for Glory because she tweeted about Moose's entrance. I will say though, you know, and we can't you know, hammered enough. Um, the talent, talent delivered. It was a booking that that you know really just doomed them. And um, the one thing I could say, and I and I seen it, um, you know, while watching the pay per view. And a lot of times, I think it doesn't go over well on TV. But I could really get the sense that the crowd was engaged, even if the matches didn't go the way that they anticipated. They seemed really into it, and I think that's encouraging. And that's why I hope moving forward, you know, hopefully financially they can do it. But every so often they're able to do live shows because I think the talent that, enge- you know, has the talent, you know, kick it into that next gear. And, and another thing too, you know, working in front of different faces, you know, not to poo on the impact zone, but, you know, you see kind of the same regulars. It's nice to, you know, whether you're working in different venues or whatever the case may be, um, it's nice. But with that said, you know, when they're going live, man, they got to make sure they're clicking on all cylinders because that one botch um, where uh, Grado, where they, in the great the Monsters Ball match, um, you know, it had me worried a little bit, man, because, you know, the referees, I'm, you know, they were local referees and I was kind of worried. I'm like, well, they're on live TV, so if they mess up. I mean, we're all going to see it. And, um, but yeah. Yep. 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 All right. So bound for glory in the books. Um, not the best show in the world, but uh, as I said, sounds like a lot of people did like it. Not our favorite show, but still a company we love and we're going to see what happens moving forward thanks for listening to us here at the impact zone please hit subscribe we'll talk to you guys soon peace